We are the Yodas of everyone. You know, 15 years of experience as a movie trainer. What is this in incredible secret uh, ingredient that other people are not talking about? They're not even covering. Some say these two trainers were quietly in the shadows. Robert Weatherwax, last of the legendary Lassie trainers from the world's greatest movie dog training family, was quietly hidden in his TV work. And Christoph Klugston elite action K9 trainer was traveling from the sub-zero arctic to the sweltering jungle heat training dogs on three continents. But a chance meeting changed all of that. Now, Robert and Christoph have joined forces and they're breaking the silence. For the first time, the secretive and hidden world of the movie dog trainer and the science of the elite tactical trainer will be revealed. That's right, they are out of the shadows. Welcome to Tactical Practical. Welcome back to the podcast. You probably missed us. <laughs> maybe or maybe not. But anyway, uh, this is, uh, of course, the only guy with the quarter mile sits day and the only 120-pound uh, American Bulldog trained to limp. And along with the last of the legendary Lassie trainers, Robert Weatherwax. And we're going to be talking about something that nobody else has really talked about on all the podcasts. Because you'll find a lot of people who are very into their own little area. That may be working dogs or, or sport obedience dogs. I think there's a few gun dog podcasts. But we're more global. We're, we try to encompass all types of dogs and a lot of different training. Because uh, from the movie background and the TV background... That means you got to be able to train a whole lot of different types of dogs, and it means that you got to have answers for a lot of different types of dogs with different uh, personalities, temperaments, uh, and that means that we have some things that probably other people don't have, and one of those is what we're going to discuss today. And you'll find a lot of people talking about, oh, you need to incorporate play into your training. You need to incorporate uh, motivation and engagement. All these things, especially the engagement thing, is a, is a big sort of fad term that people are using in the last five years or so. Everything's about focus and engagement, especially with the sport, uh, obedience, sport bite dogs. They'll talk about that a lot. You won't find the sled dog guys talking about that so much. But I throw it out there because, again, I have that big breadth of training different types of dogs for a long time. And I've I got to add again that Robert and I collectively together have been training dogs for 100 years. There is nobody else. We are the Yodas of everyone. <laughs> Basically, we're the Yodas. When people who have trained for a while and they reach a plateau, who are they looking for? Us. Basically, us. And I've had lots of people come to me because of that. I just want to throw that out there because, you know, sometimes you need to hear that background a little bit. So anyway, what we're going to be talking about today is something that precedes all of those. It, when you have it, it instantly gives you the dog motivation, gives you motivation too, and it also will have the engagement will be brought into it. So all these other things. So we're at a lower base level, I would say. And what we got to do, one of the things we got to do is what you're going to find out in this podcast. Uh, and there are a lot of different aspects to this, a lot of ways to define it. I'm going to give a few, and Robert's going to take, take over. We'll come back, and as usual, we usually take tangents, and you end up with a lot of information, so stay with us all the way through the entire podcast. Okay. All right, so we're going to start out. I'm going to start out. What is this in incredible secret uh, ingredient that other people are not talking about? They're not even covering, and that is – enthusiasm enthusiasm and that means you and the dog working together can you be enthusiastic with the dog and how do you get the dog to be enthusiastic there are a lot of ways to do that but when you i'm going to cover this overall sense and robert's going to go into some details so what i'm going to say is that enthusiasm kills the boredom it also works with dogs who are well, in tactical stuff, we would call slow tempo or fast tempo, meaning the slow tempo dogs are what a lot of people would call calm. The fast tempo dogs were a lot of people call hyperactive. Look at Malinois, look at Dutch Shepherds uh, when they're going zing, zag, zagging or uh, a few other dogs when they get charged up, especially when they're doing things that are at their at their core level, meaning they're chasing uh, game. Uh, they're after rabbits. They're, 
they're after squirrels, that sort of thing. Those dogs are in a different state of mind. They're, everything is fast, 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 fast. A lot of people can't train that type of dog. But they they want to try to shift it down into calm, which is okay. It's all right. But a lot. But the the real proof of the pudding, as they say, is in your ability to be able to, to take the dogs in fast tempo, high tempo, and in slow tempo, and then have them work and work with both ends of the spectrum and you can do that by enthusiasm because enthusiasm was what those high uh, tempo dogs are craving because they are very enthusiastic it's a base biological need to try to go after like the sight hound is going out the greyhound is going after the rabbit the saluki the borzo the the lurcher they're all going after the rabbit among other types of dogs the pointers they're going after the the birds the waterfowl that sort of thing is at their base level. So they have enthusiasm about that, but how can you channel that into other aspects? And, or how can you take your golden doodle to go to the other extreme? And how can you make that dog enthusiastic about learning? Because when they're enthusiastic, they will learn. They will learn quickly, I mean, incredibly fast. And that's why we can produce results in training new behaviors very quickly because we want the dog to be enthusiastic as we will be enthusiastic about the results. So anyway, that's a, a little overview of it. And uh, Robert, give us some of the details about how you deal with this overarching category of enthusiasm or being enthusiastic. Well, engage, engagement is uh, pretty much a matter of interpretation because if you look in the dictionary, engagement means to do battle with the enemy. And uh, obviously to do battle with our dog is not the goal. So what we want to do is uh, make it fun, right? You know, uh, provide a little excitement to uh, the program so that um, the dog doesn't get bored. Uh, also, um, when I'm doing a home training program, uh, the core of the training is recall, heal, and stay. Um, those are the things that I'm doing most of. So if I have a dog that's uh, pretty good at stay, pretty mellow. I'm probably going to have to go a little bit more to, um, you know, something that will inspire a little enthusiasm on the dog, getting the dog to move around and uh, you know, call them to you and, and do some walking down the street. Um, so, you know, it depends on the dog. It also depends on the age of the dog because you need to make it even more uh, fun when you're dealing with younger puppies. And uh, one of the, some of the younger dogs that I work with have to have you know, recesses for one, but they also have to, you have to mix it up. Um, you can't just do one thing, you know, over and over again, or we're going to do stay for a whole hour. Um, no, we're going to do 15 minutes of stay, then we're going to go outside, and we're going to do some recall, um, you know, then and I'll give the chance for a dog, the puppy, if it's a puppy, to go to the bathroom. Um, do some recall, then we, uh, once we wear out the dog a little bit, that works us right into the heel, and then we can segue from the heel back to the stay. Uh, so it's kind of like a triangle. And of course, you can deviate from that. You can change it up depending on less stay or more stay, uh, uh, more recall. Uh, then you can start determining what the dog's weaknesses are. And you can start focusing on that. But in the beginning, I'm just going around that triangle, 10, 15 minutes, depending on the age of the dog, um, short sessions, and then a recess and back to work. I never take the, the training leash off um, unless they have to go outside or uh, you know, go to the bathroom, uh, then I, I might take it off. Um, so that allows me to work on some of the behavioral things like dogs jumping and dogs barking um, and things like that that uh, occur naturally. You know, a behaviorist and a, a home in-home dog trainer, um, it's a little bit different than what I used to do when I was training dogs for films because I have, you know, 15 years of experience. As a movie trainer, I grew up in the, in the film industry watching my dad and my grandfather and my greatest competition has always been my own family. Okay, so in in the overall sense of, okay, so there's a, this idea that we have, you want to be enthusiastic and you, wanna, and you want the enthusiasm for the dog. So what are mechanical or what are the breakdown for this? And we're really giving you, I'm really giving you a free consult here in the general sense. And that is, okay. The things, what is the things that the dog likes to do? Does the dog like to tug? Does the dog like to chase uh, balls uh, or chase uh, other things that you might want to throw? Does, it, uh, does the dog uh, really food motivated? All these things can create enthusiasm. 
And there are a lot of ways to use that to create enthusiasm for the dog. And you'll make it more like a, a, a playful learning environment, which everybody, when the stress is lower, you learn faster. And that this is proven in, psycho, in psychological testing and many, many, many studies. You want it to be a relaxed environment, especially when you're first learning, especially with the puppies. You don't want any negative something that would be bad to happen during any training system, uh, time. Later on, you could add things, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. So you're going to use things that create enthusiasm, that want to get the dog going. And you say, well, what if the dog doesn't have this? Every dog is going to want to eat. Sometimes you might find out that for training purposes, you'll have to use something that you, that you normally don't feed the dog because a lot of people will call it high value uh, reinforcement through food but look you'll do anything as a human <laughs> if you're in a if you're in a bad situation you're stuck in the third world country you're you'll end up doing anything to eat or drink water we're not trying to get to those uh, levels of uh, deprivation for dogs although some people have used that in the past but we're not talking about that what i'm saying i'm using that as an example that every dog is food motivated regardless of what anybody else might say it's just uh, what might be selective, it's sort of like cats. <laughs> finicky right, is the word to use. I, my jungle dog is like that. He's finicky about what he wants to eat. Uh, and it's kept him alive, kept him alive by not just eating everything. I got some that will eat a rock, you know, and, and they would be dead in the jungle. Anyway, I say that to give everybody an overview of that you're going to find something that the dog likes. And you do this by having making the connection which would be the bond, and that's all part of the enthusiasm because you're not enthusiastic to work with people you don't have a bond with. Uh, you know, oh, man, I hate to have to work with Fred. You know, <laughs> I don't want to go in with this guy or that guy. And even in the movie business, there are people that, you know, uh, that Robert likes and or wouldn't like, and, and I've had people that I've worked with in the military situations that I don't, you know, oh God, you know, I got to do this, you know. So you're not enthusiastic, you're not gonna be at your best. So you wanna make that bond is what I'm getting to with the dog. It's gonna make everything better. So when you do this, one of the things that's extremely crucial and something that uh, you won't find a lot of people doing, especially in the uh, in the commercial pet dog business, because they they have to sell, they have to sell it. And if you try to say, well, I'm selling you the results, a lot of people don't get that over the time. They they want they see the time. It's like, oh, you're going to spend an hour with my dog, two hours with my dog, three hours with my dog. They see that as uh, more valuable to them. But for the dog, that's not what's valuable. It's the actual learning and producing results. So I want very short, successful uh, endeavors. So every time I'm training, I may do two minutes of, of something because if the dog is boom, boom, boom and completely right, there is no need. We don't want to do like in the old days where you just endlessly do these repetitions because that makes the dog really dull and listless. And maybe some of them will perform still, but there it's like working. If you had very few of these jobs remain, but if you, back in the days of the assembly lines and stuff where you're just constantly uh, whatever, putting a hubcap <laughs> on a wheel or something endlessly, you know, eight hours a day. Uh, it's mind numbing, killing you, you know, and it, you're not going to be, but if you only had to do 10 seconds of that, boom, 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 you're going to be much better and you're going to have a better uh, attitude about it. Same thing with the dogs. So one of the keys here with the enthusiasm is to keep it short and if they're successful, why are you trying to do more? This isn't an endurance event just for training. It's about the success of the training, not about the duration of the training. Oh, you know, this is, I really differ from a lot of people on, on this. So, and we, and I do a lot of trainings during a day, a lot. Uh, five is usually what I try to shoot for. And those aren't very long, you know, like how do I get, how did I get the dog, you know, do the quarter mile sit stay and recall what exactly how I'm telling you, you know? Uh, and yeah, that's a long time. He sits there and waits before he gets a signal to come back. But that was built up through these shorter training periods. Uh, and the same thing with the with the, the big guy, the bulldog, learning how to limp. And I'm not going to describe that because nobody else can do that. I'm not going to get into the details. 
but I will say it was very short periods of training. So anyway, this enthusiasm, it has to be cultivated and, and it builds. And I want to almost say, you know, it snowballs. You can, you can create this big snowman by having these small little successful snowballs and then you roll them down the hill. Uh, and if you don't destroy the ski chalet <laughs> that's below you, you can end up with a gigantic ball of snow and then you get another one and another one and another one. So uh, that's my bizarre analogy about how to enthusiasm and how important it really is for dogs. And all of these other things are contained in it, it contained in the motivation, the everything. But the bonding is, is incredibly important that you, you must have with the dogs. The dog has to trust you. And that really, the bonding comes down to trust and, and a few other things. But the trust is there so that you can uh, be enthusiastic with the dog. And the dog doesn't is not scared of you and not weirded out by you. And Robert goes into people's houses. Uh, quite a bit, and, and obviously, and, and he trains dogs. And one of the things he's got to do is get the dog past the weird out stage with them. Uh, I mean, Robert, you want to you want to talk about that a little bit because that's yeah. part of you know the, the the sessions uh, basically are dependent upon the dog. Uh, when I do a session, they never look the same um, with each dog, and the biggest reason is because uh, each dog has a different energy level, a different strength. Uh, I talk a lot in my uh, my book about my training book about uh, you know stay dogs and go dogs, and um, you know for example I was working with two dogs today, two uh, labradoodles who had almost extreme opposite uh, personalities. One was very good at stay, uh, one was very good at, at movement and action, heel. Uh, you know I want to be moving all the time, so I, I'm dealing with you know polar opposites, and I'm getting them to work together. Um, it's only the second session that I've worked with these two dogs. They're staying together on a mark. Um, they're both uh, working on the recall independently. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm working on heel independently and eventually I'll join that together uh, since I'm teaching them opposite sides to make it easier for, for the owner. Uh, Christoph talked about using, uh, you know, motivation like toys and, and I do use food in my training, uh, you know, no matter what other people may say, uh, I trained the same way Rudd trained uh, my grandfather, uh, you know, decades ago, uh, a, se up a century ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I haven't really changed a whole lot. Um, there are a few uh, tools that I have at my disposal that weren't available uh, in the 1920s. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, I, I still, I use food and I use toys and I use a, 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 a sock or a towel uh, as a you know a, a motivational tool for tug of war or whatever you know you whip out a toy on a movie set and it can bring a dog out of a funk maybe a dog that's losing a little energy you can pick them right up uh, by having the sudden appearance of uh, a toy or, or something like that as i mentioned in previous episode that we, we've even used other dogs to motivate dogs yeah. um, you know whatever it is that gets that dog to go to be fully engaged that word that we we talked about before and um you know it, it's not so much about what the dog's getting at the end of their session for me it's about what are they getting when it's when they're in the session because um i want it to be uh stimulating to the dog i, I use a lot of energy in my voice um when I, when they do something right i mean i use the high voice and i i, I shower them with affection and, and you know my dad used to get on me about that when i was a young trainer he'd say you know you might have liked your praise a little bit more worthwhile. You know, if I'm going to do all this stuff for you, uh, you at least make the praise worthwhile. So I, I really focus a lot on what my dad told me. I hear that voice in my head all the time telling me, better praise, better praise. And, uh, and that's, that's a, a big part of uh, my training. And, and my clients will tell you the same thing that, you know, it's kind of entertaining uh, because you can't hide. Christoph and I have been working dogs all this long and all this time. And, and you know, a lot of trainers get burned out, but you really have to love uh, doing what you do to be a good dog trainer. If you don't love being a dog trainer, then you shouldn't be a dog trainer um, because that energy comes from that stimulation within yourself of knowing your dog's learning and is enjoying what he's doing. So when you do your next session, they're looking forward to it. They're not uh, thinking, oh my God, we got to go through this again. Oh, no. <laughs> You know, um, it's got to be fun. You know, if it's not fun, um, then 
you know, they're not going to want to keep doing it. You're not going to want to keep doing it either. Yeah. So you have to make it fun for yourself. Sometimes I get bored with, with my training because I do a lot of the same thing, you know, day after day, household after household. So sometimes, you know, I'll go a different street or I'll do a different thing or I'll do a stay in a different location. Uh, I'll just take advantage of the landscape that's available to me at that particular home or property, uh, the neighborhood. I'll try to use different things, not so much to expose the dog to other things, but also to stimulate me to keep it fun for me because I like to see what the dog can do when there's a lawnmower going on right there. Uh, or, uh, you know, a bicycle, a bunch of kids riding bicycles. Uh, I'm looking for stuff that I can use. Uh, so when when the clients say to me, hey, should I put the kids in the other room? Uh, I'm like, no. Would the kids be in the other room if the dogs were out normally? Uh, no, they'd probably be out here messing with the dogs. I'm like, well, I don't want them to mess with the dogs when I'm training, but I do want them around um, because I want to simulate what real life is all about, not uh, something that, uh, you know, is created a pet store uh, in a little room uh, where you get a bunch of dogs together in a place that doesn't mean anything to them. So, you know, a lot of the training I do is taking advantage of, um, you know, what motivates the dog. So if I want to do recall, I'll put the owner on the other side of the yard, the one they're attached to, and I'll use that and call them away because now I've got the greatest thing that they love. I'm using it to my advantage on a recall. And of course, I'm doing it gently. I'm reeling the dog in. I'm using food or using whatever motivates the dog. It could be a toy um, or, or a sock. And uh, so I'm using everything around me. That's why I find that, you know, if I were a board and train kind of trainer, I wouldn't have the owners to use to my advantage. And uh, I, I find that, that having the, an owner around really helps me and it helps them because they learn. Um, but it also helps me because I can use ways to manipulate the dog based on where I locate the owner and, and where I am in the relationship I have as opposed to the relationship that the owner has. Mm -hmm. So um, anyways, I'll pass it over to Christoph, but that's a day in the life of me and going inside people's homes. And, and uh, you know, I always have to figure out, like, oh, where's the bathroom in this house? Uh, you know, I, 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 oh, that's right. It's over there. It's like, you know, in all these homes, I can't remember where all the bathrooms are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you're sort of like a twisted uh, Home Alone. Sort of yeah. thing, yeah, twisted Home Alone script, but uh, yeah, that's 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 kind of uh, getting a little uh, more detail there. And but what I was going to say, it's always going to be who is going to be with the dog the most. And so Robert's trying to incorporate the the in product, which would be with the owner, uh, and that's very important. I, I do a lot of, I've always done training. Uh, I've done training where I'm the trainer, and then you have a handler, uh, and then but there's a handler, there's a pass off where the handler and they're supposedly supposed to learn all these things, and, uh, and then, not just from me, but that they have a handler program they go through and stuff, and then that's a whole other story. But what I'm what I I'm, I'm being more pure about just the person you the dog trainer as the dog trainer because I have a lot of people who are dog trainers and they want to get better. And so I'm more co concentrating on that. Robert's more concentrating on, okay, here's the home, here's home environment uh, with the people who are the pet dog owners. And you do have to have a pass off. Even if you do the board train, you need to spend time, you've got to spend time with the owners. Uh, and we've covered this a little bit. It, well, not a little bit. We covered this in other podcasts. And I will only say this again, is that you need owners who are involved with the dog and want to be involved there are people who don't want to know anything they just want to know what the what the words are you know what are the commands what do i have to say what do i that's it and they don't want to do anymore uh it's just like people who just want to get in the car and they're like what do i push to make it go <laughs> you know so but the more involved you are the better you're going to be and that's what robert tries to do is incorporate the people involved the people who are the pet dog owners uh i'm trying to approach uh, this more from the dog trainer point of view like i want to make the trainers better and so i'm trying to say you need to do these things and enthusiasm will definitely get that there as robert's saying we have to we have to read every dog which we've talked about in another podcast so a lot of things we talk about all feed on each other it's a big puzzle there's all these pieces and they all fit together nothing not, not one thing is actually isolated from other stuff so that's why you might hear some redundancy in things that we're saying or when you hear about a certain 
uh, topic. Then it's like, oh, but you guys said this and this other thing. Well, good, because then it's driving it home that that part is very important also. And that all, all these things are not in isolation. Uh, we count on the fact that you will be listening to the podcast and going back through them, using them as references because we're putting it out there. We're, we're expending the energy and the time and the effort to disclose all these things that a lot of people don't know, like how am I able to do things other people are not able to do it, that are they're able to do. I mean, why am I the only one on YouTube who can do the things I can do? Why, is, why are so many people scared to accept my challenges? Well, then maybe you should listen to me. Because if I can do it and they can't do it and they make excuses or they try to go off on a, a, a tangent or red herring, oh, your dog is fat or something, you know, they don't know anything things about American bulldogs for one thing. Uh, and uh, one of the things I would say that, that uh, Robert said, you know, you, you want to keep motivated and stuff. My dogs motivate me. Like when I come in, I see my bulldog I, and the heat changes my mood right away. I just see that big guy and it's like, you know, he, he, he always wants to see me. He's happy. Um, it's just, they, boof. I mean, Robert said, you know, how do we do this? People ask, how, how can we do this for so many years? It's the dogs. <laughs> it's not the people. It's the dogs that, that drive me that keep, keep doing it because each dog is so cool. Uh, I mean, in the dogs that other people can't train or they think, oh, you can't do this with this dog or that. like uh, Robert's talked about Betty before. Oh, you can, you're not going to be able to train this dog. The dog's never going to amount to anything. Same thing with my bulldog. Nobody would think that that dog uh, would can do what he can do at this point. And it's, but it's the, because of the dogs, because we made a bond with the dogs. Uh, we might even, you know, uh, made some uh, promises to the dogs. I, I have over the years. I promise to do this, if you, <laughs> you know. But anyway, I, I put that all in there, and it may seem like, what the hell is this guy talking about? Deep, profound stuff. That's what I'm talking about. Here, these are the things you're not going to hear other places, and it may not make sense to you if you're a beginning trainer. Or if you're just looking for, I want to know how to make my dog do this or make my dog do that. I'm going deeper than that. Robert's giving you deeper stuff than that, too. So that's one of the things I say, you know, replay this. And as you get better and better, you're going to find out that we're at a different level than other people that you're going to run into on YouTube talking because we got a lot more years than they do. Like I've got alone, i got 50 years. I can't even, there are people, there are very few people that even approach 30 years uh, uh, in different spheres, you know, and together we got a hundred. There is nobody. Nobody has what we have. So I'm saying that because I want to impress upon you the fact that we know what the hell we're talking about. Anyway, so enthusiasm, go back through this and, and, and listen to it and then try to make a session with your dog. Very short, very short sessions. That's the whole thing. You're not there to drive the dog to boredom to tears or yourself to boredom or to tears uh and and basically that is you know this is a an important aspect that you need to grasp and understand and if you do you'll be ahead of the game and be ahead of other dog training you know you want to be more process driven i i think more about the process than i think about the results i know a lot of trainers are result driven and they're thinking about what i want this dog to do and how do i get there um, but you want to think about the process is the dog enjoying the process is it getting you to the next place um, with a wet tail that's wagging? You know, we had to use a lot of tie downs when we were doing movies because the dogs were too happy. They enjoyed working too much. And we had to use a tie down on their tails because they were wagging all the time. <laughs> and maybe they had to be scared or something, uh, yeah. you know, and maybe they're in a group. Uh, so we had to use tie downs, because, but that's the, that's the least of our problems that the dogs enjoying working too much. Yeah. Uh, so think about the process. Think about how the dog is getting there. And it's not just about the fact that he got there. You know, I hear a trainer saying that, you know, it doesn't matter how I train the dog, what techniques I use, because as long as I get the job done, but it's not just about getting the job done. Um, and when I talk about that process in my training, where, uh, how it evolves differently for each dog, Let's take puppies, for example, or younger dogs or dogs that don't have great stamina. Uh, I might do the recall first when they have energy, right? Um, and then once they get a little bit tired, I might segue in the heel because I typically combine the, the recall and the heel. But uh, And then from heel, now the dog's tired. Now I can go to doing my stay. So I'm using the dog's energy to dictate what we do. If the dog has way too much energy, I'll do recall. Uh, if the dog has 
you know, no energy, I'll put them on a stay. Um, so I'm, I'm using the terrain, I'm playing it dog by dog. I'm not going in with the book and saying, this is how I'm going to train your dog today, because I really don't even know. Uh, when I go in there, I'm like, I have no idea what I'm going to do with your dog. But by the end of two hours, he's going to be a changed dog. And by the next time I come next week, he's going to be, you know, oh, my God, it's him. He's back. And he's going to be happy. So yeah, dog training is that the dogs actually look forward to seeing me. Uh, dogs that maybe want to bite me the first time I came there. Uh, now I want to go home with me. Uh, so that that's that's what you want. You want your dog to enjoy the process. And uh, don't worry about the results. The results will come if you follow the process. And Christoph and I will teach you that process and how to understand uh, what motivates your dog. Uh, aside from the material aspects, you know what is the trigger for your dog? What what gets their their engine going? Um, because that's really important. And, if you don't know what gets your dog's engine going, then you don't really know your dog. Yep. Okay. So uh, I just want to throw this in because uh, if you've been with us for a while, you probably say, hey, hey, you guys haven't said something you normally say. Yeah. Basset hounds. So basset hounds. So uh, Robert does a lot of stay training with basset hounds. I just I, I throw that in there. Not too much recall. Yeah. Not, not too, too much. much. Not too much recall. And it's kind of, <laughs> and it's, and it kind of takes a while so for yeah. the recall. Because they've got the short little stubby legs. I just saw a, 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 a mix of a, a corgi and a basset hound at the park when I was out there earlier today. Man, I just kind of feel sorry. You know what I mean for the dog? Yeah, because yeah, they got they really got legs that are only like that. But anyway, so there's our basset hound illusion, and we'll see, we'll talk to you guys, right. and we'll see you guys uh, like, share, and subscribe, obviously, and we'll talk to you later.